Hey guys, I'm Sam Luce. I've just finished a pretty massive mixing project and album. It's reminded me of some of the pitfalls that I've made in the past, some of the mistakes that people often make when mixing, and I want to take a look at nine reasons why your mixes maybe don't sound as good as they could do. So thinking about volume instead of frequencies is a mistake people often make. Mixing is like 80% frequency balance. If you can't hear something, it's because the frequency content of that instrument isn't being allowed to come through. It's not necessarily because it's not loud enough. It's because the frequency content of that instrument is being buried in some way. If you turn the vocal up to be heard over the top of harsh guitars, then it's an EQ issue with the guitars. It's, it's not a volume issue. Your guitars are EQ'd wrong. You bring up the volume of the vocal and now it's too loud because it wasn't too quiet in the first place. Check the EQ of the instrument you can't hear something over and attend to that first. You'll be making far fewer volume mistakes. Turning stuff up instead of turning other stuff down. This is related to what we just looked at. It's far better to turn something down than it is to turn something up. Clearly this isn't true for every time in every scenario, but it's important not to automatically just turn the fader up if you can't hear a mix element. Instead, think about what it is that's getting in the way and consider turning that down first, whether it's a volume change or an EQ issue, as we spoke about a moment ago. Sending out rough mixes. Now, bands and artists always want to hear their mixes straight away. That's natural. But by sending out rough mixes to the artists, what you're actually doing is making all the subsequent moves you make be governed by the artist and not by you as the mixer. The artist is going to reply with a few directions, turn this up, turn this down, whatever it is, and you're going to make those moves for them instead of considering what they actually mean by them. When the artist asks you to turn their vocal up, is that actually what they mean? Or is it that you just can't hear it too well because it lacks some of the top end or some of the mid-range bite? Trust your instincts, mix the track yourself, then send it off when you are happy with it. You'll get fewer mix revisions that way as well. Going overboard with effects. The reason we use effects like delay and reverb is so that that instrument that we're applying the effect to sounds different than the other stuff in the mix. We apply reverb to a snare because it gives it that long tail, a tail that sounds like a snare, but it wouldn't sound good on a bass guitar. If you're going crazy and adding effects to every instrument, like massive canyon style reverbs to everything, you're missing the point of adding effects in the first place. A little tie-in reverb can be good to gel a mix together, but if you're going overboard, it's as bad as not using any effects at all. Not preparing your session. Now, I love to have my sessions arranged the exact same way every time. I know what my drums look like, I know what my guitars look like, but it's more than that. I'm trimming out silence in between pieces of audio so I have a roadmap in front of me every time I look at a whole session. If I've got like eight guitar tracks and the regions all just run from the start to the finish of the song, it's incredibly difficult to be able to pinpoint which guitars I want to focus in on when I'm making a move. By trimming the silence so the regions are only there when they're audible, you're taking out a lot of the time you'll spend searching around. You'll be taking out a lot of the guesswork. Mixing in solo. This is an old thing that everyone tells you, but I can't stress how important it actually is. Mixing in solo is just plain useless. There's no reason for it other than if you're desperately trying to track down a resonance or, or something. Always, always, always make volume, overall EQ, compression, whatever processing changes in the mix. Your listener doesn't have a solo button, but they do have a skip track button to turn off your bad sounding mix because you've soloed instruments too much. Use presets and templates. Seriously, I know everyone tells you you shouldn't use them, but you really should. It's just the ones that come with your plugins, your door, or the ones you buy off some TikTok producer that you shouldn't use. Make your own presets that you know work every time for specific scenarios. Make templates that work for different genres for you. If you've got a kick and a bass that aren't working well together, well, bring up that preset that you saved last time that this was an issue, and adjust it from there instead of starting again every time. If you know you use the same buses every time when mixing, a drum bus, drum parallel, drum reverb, etc., don't make them fresh every time. Just save them in your template and mix within that session. Less time making buses, more time mixing. Stop using so many meters. Meters are good at what they're good at. They're great when you want to check your overall balance of your mix, when you want to see where the resonances are. There are loads of examples where you should use a meter. But by using analyzers for frequency balance, phase coherency, crest factor for every single instrument all the time, it's ridiculous. Close the analyzers until you need them. 
Stop using them all the time just because they're flashy lights and you think they're going to be the golden ticket to making a fantastic mix. Lastly, gain staging. This isn't why your mix doesn't sound the way you want it to. Correct gain staging doesn't make the difference between a terrible mix and an amazing sounding mix. It makes the difference between being too quiet and noisy and too loud and distorted. That's basically it. Make sure your red lights aren't flashing and stop talking about gain staging. People are starting to worry about you. Mm -hmm.